I'm going to shift gears now, and this is probably going to be the most exciting portion of our dialogue today. Not that any of it has been dull, frankly, um, but we had some very candid discussions uh, during our Twitter chat, essentially trying to tie break between some of the data sets we saw at ASCO GU. So I'm going to start with you, Tian, with a tough question of which is better, Axia Velomab or Axia Pembro? <laughs> you know, I don't you knew think, that was coming. I knew that was coming, but you know, I really don't think we have head-to-head -head comparisons. And so I really love uh, Dr. Escudier's uh, editorial where he really places all three of them, uh, these trials, in, in context and in, in juxtaposition. So of that table where he puts Pembro, uh, Pembrolizumab with Exitinib, Avelimab, with exitinib and then nivolumab, belumimab trials, and really compares across the characteristics of the trials. You know, I, one of the things that stuck out to me was the higher percentage of favorable risk patients in the Pembro exitinib trial. It was about 31% compared to 23 and 21% in the other two trials. So a higher number of favorable risk patients, and we're seeing an earlier overall survival difference in that trial. And so I think these favorable risk patients are really driving what we're seeing, the differences here in this um, in this uh, keynote trial. Um, some of the other differences that I saw across the trials, you know, um, were the, the that the complete response rates were very different, right? We already talked a little bit about it, but Pembro Exitinib had a complete response rate around 5.8% compared to Velumab Exitinib right around, you know, 3.8% and then um, and then Nevo Ipi around 10.2% in that table. And so very different. Um, and so it depends, as we say, of what we're shooting for in that first line setting. Um, and then finally, as we think about the overall survival differences, you know, we've seen the overall survival improvements compared to sunitinib in this first line setting with the Kino 426 trial, as well as with the Checkmate 214 trial. I think a Valumab exitinib, you know, the data are just not mature enough to make that call. And as uh, Dr. Schwery said from the uh, GU ASCO stage, you know, it's not over till it's over, uh, I think we still need to wait for the overall survival endpoints there. But pull out your crystal ball for a minute for me, if you will. And I know this is a challenging <laughs> question, yeah. but what's going to happen? Are we going to see an OS advantage with the same magnitude with Axievelumab uh, as compared to Axipembro? What you do know, you think? I think that the, the baseline characteristics of these patients were a bit different, but I, I do think that we'll see an overall survival benefit at some point, and maybe two years from now when we see that report out, I can be proved right. Uh, but I, I am, I am um, I'm hopeful that you know we'll have multiple agents and um, more, more um, uh, you know, prospects and and potential treatment options available for our patients. Interesting. So, so Brad, you're a little known fact. Brad's office is right next to Dr. Chueri <laughs> yes. at Dana Farber. So we're going to be listening to his words very, very carefully. Right. He has the insider's perspective here. Um, so, what are you going to use if faced with the option of axiavelumab and axipembro? patient sitting right in front of you, which are you going to counsel them to take? And assuming you're not sitting next to Dr. Show. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I think with, it, with the data we have at this point in time, with it right now, I mean, I think one of them has an overall survival benefit and one does not um, with similar follow-up. Now, granted, the trials enrolled at different rates and you had different things overall, but right now that's where we're at. So I think overall survival is important. Patients want to know what's, what's going to give me the best chance to be alive in a year and you know, we, say, we can say that Pember Axi is better than Sinitinib, and we can't say that for Exitinib value map. So I think today, right now, it's Pember Exitinib, but again, it's not over till it's over. And so as we get more, more data, that, that certainly may change overall, because Exitinib value map um, does seem to be very well tolerated. I mean, the rates of immune related adverse events, the need for high dose steroids, were much lower than we see when you were Now, we haven't seen that data reported for Pember Axi. But it did seem to be very well tolerated. The infusion reactions that we were concerned about with Valumab with appropriate pre medications were much less. So, Exitinib Valumab is certainly a well tolerated regimen. Um, and so, I think with more follow up, we'll have a better sense. Interesting. And, and tell us about the why. Why is it that we see this magnitude of OS benefit with Axi Pembro and we're not seeing it at this point with Axi Avelumab? The office must be buzzing with that <laughs> conversation. I, I think we, we, we don't know. I think we, we really. It's hard to say, I mean, as Tam pointed out, like we see the different differences. It's odd. You would think that, you know, this favorable risk being higher in Pembroxy would make it harder to get overall survival benefit, that they may do better with TKI alone. We saw that in Checkmate 214, but yet we see this here. So I think there's a lot of things that are going on. When, when you look at the exit and value map enrollment, you know, they enrolled quite a few, and then they put the trial on hold for a while because they were changing the analysis, and then they enrolled again. So you have this sort of hump-like, and so maybe just with more follow-up, you're gonna get more events, but 
it's going to be delayed. So I think more time will tell. I mean, the PFS2 data for exit and evaluation is certainly very intriguing. It's just that you know, if that bears out, there probably will be an OS benefit, um, but more time. But it's likely not because of different patient populations, because right. it's a randomized trial. So if you see 6% complete response or 5.8% complete response with axipembro, even sunitinib arm in that patient population also had 3% complete response, right? So it's like twice as much as sunitinib. But a bigger question is, why we use immunotherapy in patients with RCC, first-line therapy? We are using immune therapy for complete responses, right? For complete durable responses. So if you look at axitinib, avulimab, axitinib, pembrolizumab, compared to sunitinib, there are twice, they are inducing twice or thrice as much complete responses. Look at EP, ipilimumab, nivolumab combination compared to sunitinib, you have a 10 times better complete responses. So if I'm using a treatment regimen, uh, immunotherapy regimen, I'm using it for complete responses. So I will rather use ipilimumab and nivolumab. And, and if I, no, go ahead. No, well, Professor Agarwal, I'm not gonna let you off that easy. <laughs> as, as you guys know, one of my best friends is sitting across the That's table right. from me here, but I asked Tian and I asked Brad, if you have a patient in front of you, which are you gonna pick? Between Axi Pembro and Axi of Elamem, what's your choice? Oh, I won't pick any of them. <laughs> I pick them with Ipilimumab and Nivolumab. Oh, okay, but your hospital formulary, for whatever reason, doesn't yes. have Nevo and Ipi. Now what are you gonna choose? Axitinib, Pembrozolumab. Why? Overall survival. Got it, that makes yes. sense. And now you gave us some good reasons why baseline demographics might not explain the overall survival difference. So what can? Why do, are we seeing this different signal between the two trials? I must tell you, this is so intriguing or perplexing. Like, they are very similar combinations. If you look at the PFS hazard ratios compared to sunitinib, which accounts for difference in patient population, 30% favorable risk, 20% favorable risk. But if you compare, you're comparing with this common competitor, which is sunitinib, right? So hazard ratios for progression-free survival is exactly similar, 0 0.69, 0 0.69. If you look at the increase in the response rates, 30% to 60%, uh, sorry, 35%, 60% in keynote axi pembro trial, and 25% to 52% with axi abulima. So overall responses, progression-free survival benefit is exactly similar. So it is. I will, I will say though that the median, though, if you look at the same data and the hazard ratios were the same, but the median progression-free survival actually reflect the population. So, um, you know, looking at the keynote um, study, the median progression-free survival for the combination was about 15 months compared to 11 months for sunitinib. You know, bigger portion of favorable risk patients. If you look at the keynote trial, or sorry, if you look at the Javelin trial, you see that progression-free survival with the um, evaluation mab exit nib arm was about 13.8 and compared to about 8.4 for uh, 8.4 months for student in so very reflective of the different um, disease populations that were en enrolled in the poorer risk um, patients um, that were on the javelin trial and the, following that analogy I fully agree with that mm -hmm. the median the median survival on the standard of care arm tells you about the population mm -hmm. but this is a randomized trial so both that patient population is being equally distributed between the experimental arm and the control arm okay. And for going by that analogy, we should have seen a survival benefit with axi avilumab because if you look at a poorer risk patient, high risk patient population, they're expected to have a lower median survival. So for the same number of patients, 800 plus patients, very similar patient numbers, the trial with axi avilumab was powered better for overall survival mm -hmm. because you had a much higher risk patient population. So that's why I'm saying it is so perplexing. Why? overall survival is so convincingly met with a hazard ratio of 0 0.53 in axi pembro trial, and we are seeing a hazard ratio of 0 0.8 almost with axi avilumab trial. It's not enough events, right? I mean, so, we can... I, I agree with you, but yeah. again, if it was a, it was a more uh, higher risk patient population... You would think that they would have enough events that's, by that's this That's my point. point. Yeah. That, yeah. that but I Brad's point is, is also true that if they held, um, you know, if the, the trial was held for a while and then re started enrolling, that that second population of patients, the second cohort, you know, just may not have met their median overall survivals. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I, again, I agree, time will tell, I hope. <laughs> Both trials are positive. So all three of you have answered, time will tell. Okay, very <laughs> yeah. good. That's, that's no, no, great I, I told you, I, the audience, yeah. among these two, yeah. I'll choose axitinib, pembrolizumab. 
because it showed it has overall survival data associated with right now. Yeah. So there's definitely high level yes. of evidence. There's as no of doubt. February 2019. Right, as of today. That's right.